PK52, the Saturday morning meeting, a couple of messages for you today. So I just posted on Twitter and on my Facebook account, uh, this guy who is really tied into Toyota. He doesn't work for Toyota, but uh, I've seen videos with him, with our, with our guru and our truck lineup, Mike Swears, and they seem to be very close. They talk like close friends. I've never met him. I don't know him. But they gave him access to the new Sequoia. So the first thing he does is he starts calling this a base, base Sequoia. There's no such thing as a base Sequoia. iForce Max is the standard power plant in there. There's nothing base about this. This is an SR5, which is not base, and it's also um, a TRD Sport, which is an upgraded package, which is not base. But I, I got to tell you, he said the word base uh, multiple times. Base, 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 base. So this is what I was talking about a few weeks ago when I put out the video about being an influencer. So now what I've done is I've put this out there because it gives an overview of some of the features and the specs of the new Sequoia, which a lot of people have no idea about. But I wanted to post this because I wanted you to see it because I don't want to hear from him. It's not who I want to hear from. There are so many sales, there's 1,238 Toyota stores out there in the United States, 1,238. And there are brilliant salespeople at every store. Some of the best salespeople we've ever had in the history of Toyota. The best ever, ever. You understand our product, you understand our hybrid product, you understand exactly what Toyota people are looking for, and so why do I have to listen to him? So Toyota brings him to Plano and gives him access. The people that work at Plano aren't even back at Plano yet. So here comes an outside influencer. They give him the vehicle, and now he's posted on the internet, on YouTube, uh, a description of the Sequoia. He starts out. He starts talking about the power plant. He said that the MPG ratings are not out yet, but the Tundra gets about combination 19. So he throws that number out, which he's unaware of whether that's correct or not. So he throws that out there. So somebody hears 19 and they're looking at something else that gets 22 done. So there's your influencer right there. And then he gets you know to the back of the vehicle and he starts talking about lack of cargo space. He puts the seat all the way back, he opens it up, and he says Tahoe, 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 Tahoe. Like the Tahoe, not as much space as the Tahoe. But not like the Tahoe, but it's not as much space as the Tahoe. Then he gets inside and he says, I'm pretty comfortable in the, in the seat, but I get in the back, I have no headroom, but I have more headroom in the Tahoe. Where's the Tahoe? Bring the Tahoe up here. Go get a Tahoe. Sit in the back of the Tahoe. Show me the difference. He does not do that. So this is what I'm talking about. We have got to become the influencers on our product. You know more about the product than he will ever know about the product. What he does is he reads a spec chart of the vehicle, and then he comes out and does a video basically just going through the specs. Every salesperson, even on day one of the job at a Toyota dealership, can read a spec sheet. They can read the horsepower, they can read the torque, they can talk about safety sense 2.5, they can talk about the space in the back, how to configure everything in there. Every one of us can do that. Why would you allow somebody on the outside of Toyota who really did a Tahoe video here? I'll, I'll, you Welcome to watch it. So on my lead on, on Twitter and on Facebook, it's out there, or you can go to YouTube and put in 2023 Sequoia. And you're gonna, this is going to come up because there's very little information out there. But this is all access. They invited this man, and I've never met him. He may be a great guy. But they invited this man to come out and drive the Tundra off-road at the Tundra testing grounds in San Antonio out on the ranch. And so he spent three or four days with the Tundra. But we didn't bring any salespeople down there to test drive the Tundra. But we brought these influencers. And there's no guarantee that they're going to have a positive response about our vehicle. We need to become the influencer. This, no, nobody paid him to start his YouTube channel. Nobody gave him a million dollars to say, hey, we want you to be an influencer. What he did was he got out there and started posting videos. He knew what he was talking about. He did his research. The videos were concise. He did different manufacturers. He built a name for himself. And now he gets 100% access to anything Toyota has that's not available at a dealership yet. And what I'm saying to everybody is, you can do the exact same thing. Post your videos, make them short, make them crisp, make them to the point. People are curious about this new Sequoia. Do they get a forerunner or do they go ahead and move into the Sequoia? They're curious about the way it's set up. They don't know. You could put a Sequoia like I've got on the screen right here and you could talk to this. You could show the inside. The photos are available. 
And you can do a five minute walk around on a Sequoia and send it out to 100% of your client base that you've sold vehicles to over the last five years. That access is available to you. That was stage one. Sorry, I'm on a little bit of a rant. I just don't like to hear people say negative stuff uh, about, uh, about Toyota. Maybe there's more cargo space in the Tahoe. Okay, fine. All right, is the resale value the same? Is the longevity the same? Is the build quality the same, Chevrolet to Toyota? When you look at J.D. Power Vehicle Dependability Survey, every single year, look at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and look at where Chevrolet is and look at where Toyota is. So are you trying to set a standard that all I have to do is add a couple more cubic inches or cubic feet to something and it becomes better? I understand the utilitarian deal about having something longer, but again, I, I, do you tell the whole story about the ownership and the reliability of Toyota when people don't understand that <clears throat> I could buy a TRD Pro 4Runner two years ago for 57 or 58 if I paid sticker price. And now with miles on them two years later, they're retailing for $66,000. What a lot of people don't understand is the value offered at the end of a Toyota. And I, and I was trying to move off of this to something else. Let me do it. I just, I don't, I don't like, don't, if you don't have anything positive to say, don't say it. You know, say, say you're doing a Sequoia. You don't have a, a Tahoe here. There's no Tahoe here. If you bring the Tahoe here, show me side by side. Don't sit there and say, here's what you're seeing here, and let me tell you what you're not seeing over there. Don't compare them if you don't have them. Do the walk around on the Sequoia. Give the features and benefits of the Sequoia. And if you want to do a comparison later with the two vehicles, make sure both vehicles are there. That, that's a fair statement. That's fair to me. Got a little bit upset when I watched this today because of the way it was presented. Again, this man is a friend to the Toyota people that, that I know about and some of the people that I know. And I know he does a lot of overviews of Toyota, but he's an outside influencer and he has his own opinions and those opinions may not make your life better. And his opinions are his opinions. That doesn't mean they're always factually completely accurate. Same with everything we say. Make sure what you say is accurate. So I went into a dealership and I did some training. And let me tell you what my focus of the training was. I, I, I said a lot more in the beginning than I needed to, but I wanted everybody to see the big picture. So we have about 15 million OEM cars will be sold this year. So the build should be 14.5 to 15.5. That's probably pretty close, depending on supply of everything new that's going to be built in the, and sold in the United States this year. So we're down from almost 18 million down to 14 to 15 million because of supply problems and, and because of some COVID outbreaks again. So you all know that. We're waiting for cars, we're looking at empty lots. But I wanted them to understand that there's a, probably 42 million used cars. So 14, 15 million new, 42 million used. So because new cars aren't coming back and because you've got jackets that are sitting there sold units that aren't even at the dealership yet, all the new cars are sold. So the biggest opportunity we have, once again, a million times I'm saying this, is to get back in to the used car market. We've allowed everybody else, if you go to a Ford dealership or a Chevrolet dealership, they don't make cars anymore. Go to a Chrysler dealership, they don't make cars anymore. And you look on the front row of their used car inventory, you've got Toyota cars, Honda cars, Nissan cars, Kia cars, because some of their customers are interested in cars, they're not interested in SUVs. So a beautiful low mileage two or three year old Camry draws traffic in, then they convert them to an SUV at Ford. That's what, that's what I would do if I was a Ford dealer. I would have inventory that drew traffic to my store so I could sell what I needed to sell. That's what the used car inventory is all about. It's all about traffic. It's all about great product for people that are used car people. But right now when there's not new cars, used car, premium used cars are the driver of the traffic to your store. Everybody knows that. So I, I, I painted that picture. And then what I tried to do at the end is I tried to say, if you're gardening and you put a seed in the ground, you don't come out the next day and get to start eating off of that plant. You have to nurture the plant, you have to grow the plant, and there is time. Whatever seed you put in is what you're going to get later on. And that's exactly the analogy that I want to talk about right now. Here's the seed we're planting right now. We don't have any cars. Used cars are at a, a gigantic premium for us to buy wholesale, and that goes back to elevated prices on the retail side. 
Eventually, the manufacturers, the OEMs, are going to start building cars again. The plants are going to be open at 100%, and the chip situation is going to be solved one way or another. You've heard several different ways the chip problem is going to be solved. Now, the inventory goes back up, and here comes customers that are two, three, and four-year-old in the car. Maybe the car they didn't really want. They went ahead and bought a pre-owned or a certified car. They really wanted a new car, but the new car, they said, well, you know what? I might get it for you in 120 days. It could be six months. They wanted a car right now. They went ahead and went with a pre-owned, and so it's not exactly what they wanted. Great vehicle. They're having great service out of it. We'd love to have it back. But we sold this thing at four or five or six thousand dollars over extra clean book based upon what we had in the car. And as the inventory comes back in, the value of their car is going to tragically go down. So we put a seed in the ground. We, we, we paid all the money for the seed. It was the best seed. It was genetically enhanced. It was going to make the best squash and the best apples. It was going to make the best broccoli. It was going to make the best lettuce. It was a genetically enhanced seed. And we put that in there, but we paid all the money for that seed. And the seed is so good, three years from now, there's so much broccoli and so much squash and so much lettuce that at the store, the prices have really gone down because the supply is abundant. In fact, there's so much produce, they're having to throw some of it away because it's not bought before it's spoiled. And so now instead of a premium price that you're getting for that squash right now, now you're paying a lower price. That's exactly what's going to happen in a numerous businesses in the United States right now as the market grows back. So what I tried to do is I tried to say, look at what you're planning and look at how you have to grow your future. Many of us really relate to the people that are in our own department. If you're in sales, you run around with, you hang around with, you joke around with, you have conversations with, you pal up with people in the sales department. And that's fine. I think camaraderie is a really good thing, but we have to understand that in any kind of sales and a commission-based sales, you don't make any money on the whole. When everybody else sells something and you don't, you make zero, and that's the way it is. You don't get a piece of somebody else's work. And that's in any kind of commission sales, no matter if you're, if you're selling commodities, if you're selling whatever, so you understand that. But the people that, that understand long-term retention is some of the greatest fixed ops people that we have in the business. Now, not everybody's great. It's just the way it is. If everybody was great, there'd be no great. But if they understand, if you've got a service rider back there and people come to that service rider because they trust them, if that service rider says you need A, B, and C, they say do it. They don't question it because they know that service rider has their best interest as a first priority. Now, there's not a lot of service riders out there like that. They're like everybody else. They go to work to make their money, then they leave, and they don't try to build their base or build their business because if you open a service door, people will be sitting in front of it the next day. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, if you look at a Toyota dealership, there's over 100 brand B repair facilities within a PMA of a one Toyota dealership. Go down the street, you've got all kinds of parts and service. You know, you got Pet Boys, you got Walmart, you got Brake Experts, you got Jiffy Lube, you've got Grease Monk. I mean, you got they're just one right after another, Firestone Complete Car Care. And so what a lot of customers don't understand, and what you need to make them understand is, is that a lot of the stuff you're buying right now is gigantic technology. What do you do if you're on the job for one week and somebody brings a hybrid RAV4 in and it's having a hybrid issue? Do you go to YouTube? <laughs> do you, I mean, what, what do you, you, there's no way you know. The great thing about a Toyota dealership, and let me walk you through a couple of bullet points here. Number one is, I may be a tech there, I'm a certified Toyota technician, and I've got a vehicle up on my rack right now, and gang, I have no idea what's going wrong with this vehicle. I can't diagnose it. I've worked on it, I've been on it for about an hour, and I know for a fact right now that I don't have the skills yet to be able to diagnose this car. I walk two stalls over, there's a master diagnostic tech there. This man or woman has been in this dealership for over 10 years, they went through expert, they've got, they've got uh, all of their certifications, and they're the top of the, of the food chain. They walk over and they go, oh, I've seen this before, it's this, 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 and this. Two things just happened. One thing is the customer's car just got diagnosed and now it'll be taken care of. Second thing is that certified Toyota technician just learned a new skill on something they were completely unaware of. Let me back you over to Firestone Complete Car Care. Where do you go? Who do you ask? You got something up there and you can't diagnose it. 
I mean, does this come out of their mouth? Well, you know, Toyota's had a lot of issues with that. You're going to have to take it over to the Toyota dealership, and they're going to be really expensive. Of course it's going to be really expensive. It's something they couldn't even diagnose. It's something that's going to cost money because cars aren't perfect. Some cars need maintenance, and every once in a while, a car needs repair. But they can't do it there. Why would anybody pay a premium for a new or a pre-owned car? And then take that car to a place called Break Experts. And I realize the title says experts. Is that true? <clears throat> Firestone Complete Car Care. Can you imagine if you lived out in California and you drove a Mirai in there, a hydrogen-based car, and go, Hannah's making a noise. I don't know what it is. I mean, we have got to, at delivery, make the customer understand there is nobody anywhere around here that should ever touch your car but my full staff, it's not one mechanic. It's not even a mechanic, it's a technician. It's not one person. Go back in your shop and count how many technicians are there. You know, 20, 25, 30. So nobody in that shop that's gone through all the Toyota schooling, if you take them all together, they don't know how to take care of a vehicle. And if all else fails, Toyota, Motor, North America has specialists that can come in to the dealership and aid the techs. Field technical specialist. This is all part of the package. But as a sales associate, as a sales manager, as a GM, as a GSM, as an owner, the last part of every single car deal should be to convince that customer beyond a shadow of a doubt that they will never get better service. And I'm talking about service that's complete, diagnosed, and done correctly. And then we need to work with our ASMs so our ASM knows I'm not giving this customer to you. I'm loaning them to you for five years so when they're ready for another car, call me. KC, come to service, please, and come back there. I'll sell them another car. I'll sell that car. Then I'll give you two customers. Working with the service riders and the tech is your future. Here's what's going to happen when our crops start to grow, and I'll finish up with this. The customer comes back in three years later. And they're eight, nine, ten, or more thousand dollars upside down. In your mind, is that a possibility? And you ask them, how much money do they have down? And the answer is, like it always is, I'm just going to use my trade. So what they're going to do is they're going to trade negative eight thousand dollars and hopefully get a lower payment. Fair? Okay, that's a customer that we can't, unless we've got an eight or nine thousand dollar rebate from the manufacturer, we can't trade them out of the car. And so. Wouldn't it be nice to sit there and go, <clears throat> you bought the car during the peak of the demand when prices were through the roof? You and I both know that. We know where we were. You needed a vehicle at that time, and we talked about it. Your vehicle is in really good shape. Are you satisfied with our service department? Oh, yeah, man. I, you know, I go back there. Julie back there is my service rider. She's the best. I love her, man. Never going to take my car to anybody else but Julie because she's amazing. So what I need to do is I need you to stay with Julie for another 12 months. Since the car is really good and everything's going, the market's turning a little bit right now, give you 12 more months, let Julie take care of the car, and then you'll be in a, in a better equity position and we can move you into the next car and hopefully get your payment a little bit lower and put you in the new technology. To me, for the people that are gonna be the, no money down or carry negative equity into a car deal over the last two to three years, this is one of the only ways we're ever going to be able to retain that customer is to be able to work with service and make sure that they have a place. If they can't trade right now, I don't want somebody going over to a domestic manufacturer, Chevrolet or Ford or somebody else, that has jumped into the pool after Memorial Day three years from now or two years from now and now running a $11,000 or $12,000 rebate or a $10,000 rebate because it's happened before. That customer trading using that rebate is money down to bail them out of negative equity into a vehicle that will not hold its value like a Toyota is a mistake. Now, I certainly understand why a customer would do it. They don't have any money down. They can get in a brand new domestic vehicle. They'll take care of them. Their payment's going to be super high, but they didn't have to have any money down. And we told them at Toyota they couldn't trade. That's a possibility. You need to look at what's going to grow from the seed you planted right now. Prepare for your future, because remember, 
the people that prepare for the future and put your way in the future <clears throat> are going to be the most successful in the car business. PK52, the Saturday morning meeting. Get me some videos out on Sequoia, on the new Tundra drop, Tacoma's coming, Forerunner's coming, Corolla Cross is out there. Get those videos out there so the consumers watch you instead of somebody on the outside.